moonshot using continuous learning to unlock breakthrough innovation. The year was 1962, and the US was embroiled in a race. It was a fierce competition, and it was the race for space. And they were kind of getting their butts kicked. I mean, we were kind of getting our butts kicked. The truth was, the Soviets had already launched Sputnik. They had put the first man in space, and they had actually had a human in space for over 24 hours. The US was falling behind. Then, in one of the most iconic speeches of the 21st century, John F. Kennedy said, we, we will go to the moon. We will go to the moon in this decade, and we will do the hard things, not because they, not, and we will do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Now, let me tell you, in 1962, getting to the moon wasn't really hard. It was more impossible. We didn't have the science or technology that we needed to achieve that at this point. And so, if you're NASA, watching the President of the United States make this bold decla declaration, what do you do? Well, what you do is you start to think of how you can experiment your way to innovation. In the book Moonshot, astronaut Alan Shepard describes how NASA used continuous discovery and experimentation to achieve the act of getting to the moon. All of my uh, stuff is not clicking quite how I thought it would. OK, so he details in the book how the scientists had to break through some of these first challenges. One of the first big challenges were the legs for the lunar lander. These legs were a critical component of the spacecraft, as you can imagine, because we actually needed to get to the moon and get back off again. But as the scientists started to look at the initial designs that they had come up with for the lunar lander, they were realizing these legs were never going to work. And so they started to figure out what are we going to do to try and get these legs to a point that they can work. So they started with generative brainstorming. And they tested and sketched out a million different ideas. They experimented with inflatable legs and retractable arms and all sorts of different things to try and solve this problem. They built models and they tested things under various conditions. And then one day, an engineer named Tom Kelly came up with an idea that seemed promising. There was an experimental metal called memory metal that he thought maybe we could build these legs out of this metal. It would be uh, flexible enough to withstand a, an unexpected landing, but could retain its shape. It was a great idea, potentially, but these engineers knew the way that you validate a good idea or not is to start testing. And so they start bu building more models, more experiments for how they could test this idea. So they tested this first prototype. They put it in a vacuum chamber. And it worked perfectly. It, it landed just the way they thought it would. They were excited. This was the first good sign they'd seen. But one experiment wasn't enough. They ran hundreds and hundreds exper of experiments with these legs to try and ensure that they knew how the legs would behave under these unexpected conditions. It's hard when you know you're going to be down on the ground and the thing that's going to be unfolding and, and happening is going to be, you have no idea how to anticipate what's going to happen. So finally, after months of testing and experimentation, they had a design that was, they were confident would work. The legs were flexible but strong. And then it worked. We got to the moon, and in 1969, this spacecraft landed, and the legs worked perfectly, along with a hundred million other small, teeny pieces that these engineers had tested meticulously over the seven years that had ensued since that speech by John F. Kennedy.
This relentless commitment to rapid experimentation, prototyping, and iterating is exactly why the United States was able to dominate this war we had with the Soviets to get to space. So even today, the phrase moonshot describes something that we see as, as impossible, something that would take a breakthrough piece of innovation and, I'm going to point out, radical collaboration. Because it's not one engineer who pulled off this feat. It was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of scientists and engineers. OK, so I see that guy over there is like, listen, lady, I didn't come here for a, a history lesson. Um, what does this have to do with us, the DevOps community, the software development community? Why do we care? Oh. Uh, that's pretty much how it feels most of the time. You're maybe off in the corner, typing feverishly because everything's important, urgent, got to get it done right away. Or you're pretty much just to bed, back to the computer, to bed, back to the computer. I don't know who, who's worked in that corporate environment. <laughs> Only one of you. Let, no, two. OK. Um, not really a serious question because that's how modern software development works. I, one of my favorite phrases for how we work in the modern world is we're overworked, but we're underutilized. OK, click on. Let's get past this. If you were an outside observer coming and looking at the state of modern software development, and you said, why did people invent Agile? You would be forgiven for assuming that it was created by business people in a goal to make software development more predictable and more reliable. OK, that's, that sounds awesome for the business. But you and I know predictability and reliability was never in the minds of the Agile framers. In fact, when they came together to have this conversation, they considered themselves organizational anarchists. It still says that on the Agile Manifesto page since 2001. They weren't trying to make, oh, well, first, let's talk about what they were fighting against. Ridiculous amounts of documentation, heavy upfront planning. They hated the fact they never got to talk to the customers, and they would get, spend years developing something, only to bring it to market and find out that that's not what the customers ever wanted to begin with. They hated the fact that they were expected to be locked in a back room, telling, just typing feverishly away, trying to achieve something without any real understanding of why they were doing it or the ability to iterate to do it better. All right? These people weren't coming to make a predictable system for the um, overlords. They were trying to start a revolution, a movement that says, we choose to not work this way anymore. It's not productive, we're not delivering value, and we want more. OK, so what happened? It was supposed to be a revolution. And instead, the certifications took over. I got to go back. This is a list. Come on, come back. Oh, no, that's a revolution. Look at all these certifications. These are various Scrum Master product certifications. Like, it's, it's just a money machine for consultants to be able to sell something into the business. And meanwhile, we are looking at Agile as a set of checklists for things that you're going to do. I mean, I typed in Agile checklist. These are good things. I mean, it's not bad to have a task board. But you can't build innovation off of a freaking task board. All right. so. I'm kind of ranting about Agile. This is what we see a lot on Teams. One of the very common things, and you guys know this, you work in these environments every day. A very common thing is the business people arbitrarily make decisions that are obviously wrong and are in complete ignorance of the data that's in front of them. 
Or another really common thing you see is agile teams just going as fast as they can, building software as predictably and reliably and transparently as they can just to get it out the door because that's what the business wants, speed. Customer feedback is either never gathered or it's routinely ignored. And the development teams are just expected to iterate on how fast they can go. And this often leads to teams that are very effective at delivery, but cannot deliver value to a customer. O honestly, are not even given the opportunity to deliver value to an end customer. OK, so I don't know where this co quote came from. Um, it, it really, really resonates with me because I look at professionals like, like those of you I see in this room, and people are passionate about their jobs, right? You didn't come and sit in a conference all day because you don't care. You came because you honestly are, have a desire to do your job well and to build something great. And if we're doing things incorrectly or if we're focused on the wrong things, we're pushing on the wrong part of the flywheel, right? And how disappointing is it to look at our, our efforts as professionals trying to change the world. Actually, one of my very favorite quotes from Jeff Patton, if you missed him speaking yesterday, he said, our job is not to build software. Our job is to change the world. And I love that vision of, of what we can be doing here. OK. so. I'm not actually here to hate on Agile, even though I just went on a bit of a rant. Um, I do actually love Agile. When I first started doing software, um, I think it was about 06, and I didn't know anything about software at all. I did know that me and my teams, I was a, in a very small startup, we had a really hard time getting software out the door, right? We had a very hard time telling our customers we're going to do something and actually being able to deliver on it. And as I started to learn about Agile, it, it, it felt like it was unlocking kind of a, a set of, of keys for me in working with my team to really just identify what was vital, what mattered, and what could we deliver in a small piece. And so, no, I'm not trying to hate on Agile, but we need it to do better. And we, as practitioners, DevOps practitioners, Agile practitioners, anybody who's on the edges, we have to demand more and expect more from how we use Agile. Because going back to NASA, if it's not experimentation based, and if it's not on the idea of rapid iteration, it, we can't actually build anything that's innovative. OK, so let's see what's on this slide. Oh, yes. I have some principles for innovation. And I considered calling these principles for radical agile. But I like the focus on innovation because we are actually at a really interesting point in, in the world. You think about the kind of technology that is coming out right now. Augmented reality, artificial reality, AI. Um, gosh, blockchain, I work for a blockchain company. And you think about the rate of change of what's going to happen over the next three to five to ten years as we take these new technologies and we figure out what they actually are going to be. This will be an, a period of time very similar to what we saw with NASA putting someone on the moon. The speed of the radical innovation and transformation that is going to happen is going to be astronomical. And at the same time, there's going to be some pressures from the other side. You know, when you watch tech banks failing, when you watch some of the largest amounts of technology layoffs that we've seen in the last who knows how many years, more value is going to be what's expected. OK, so I'm going to talk you guys through each of these. I assume you read them. I'm not going to read them for you. For you. Engineering forward. So 
you remember the story I just told you about the astronauts? Um, guess who didn't make all of the decisions on how they were going to try and solve the problems? Guess who didn't sit there and say, hey, engineer, here's what you need to do? NASA understood that the engineers are the ones who are going to solve the breakthrough innovation problems. And so for all of us, especially anybody who's on the kind of more the operational side of development, scrum masters, DevOps professionals, bring your engineers into the room. All right, now, I didn't make this, come on. I'm calling it here developer and engineer forward. I prefer just engineer forward um, because, th like you guys, a lot of you might not be developers, but you're certainly engineers. And the point is we need to have engineers in the right place in the organization. We cannot have them in the back room waiting to be told what they're going to build if we are going to build truly innovative things. We have to include them in the problem space. So you've maybe heard this um, phrase, oh, this is a great quote, I almost skipped this. So you'll notice at, at NASA, again, they weren't micromanaging people, they weren't telling them what to do or what to build. They were letting them do it, empowering them, supporting supporting them, and holding them accountable. There's no, no problem with accountability. Just Agile shouldn't be your accountability engine. Um, I maybe don't always know how a clicker works. So Steve Jobs says it doesn't m make sense to hire smart people and tell them what to do. And you know, this is a really popular quote. It gets thrown around all the time. I don't know if people think, oh, this quote is about engineers. This quote is about, that's, they know that's how they were able to do the things that they were able to do because they brought the engineers out of the basement, brought them forward in their organization. You've maybe heard the statement that in product, in, uh, product management ha owns the, the what and the why, and engineering owns the ha how. I hate this. I hate it so much. As a product person, let me tell you who I want in the, in, in, right next to me while I'm talking about what and why. It's my engineers. You know, yesterday Jeff talked about how they, uh, a certain Atlassian per product manager always would have their lead engineer in the room when the, with them doing interviews. When engineers get to play in the problem space, we come up with better solutions. It's just, it's, it's incontrovertible to me. So, do it like this. There certainly are going to be places where there's divisions, but this is a shared responsibility, not just around the what and the why, but around the how. Okay, so, now we're on to my next one. This is replace assumptions with evidence. <sighs> Let's talk about assumptions, guys. Let's maybe me not get feedback. I, I have long hated this, this saying. Um, it's a thing that makes an ass out of you and me. Essentially, an assumption is a belief that we have, that we have no evidence of or proof. And this is a toxic behavior that your organization and every organization I've ever worked with this, they do it all the time, right? You do, it one, until you start to look for it, you don't realize how, how much this is an epidemic. And what I mean by this is we, all of us, walk around in the corporate world treating an assumption that we have as if we have proof. And it's a toxic trait because corporations spend a crazy amount of time meetings where a lot of very high paid people sit and argue about this, their assumptions, and the belief that they have about those assumptions. It often reminds me of, um, some of you are old enough to remember before we had the internet. Um, I was married my first couple of years before there was internet, and it was crazy how much time me and my husband would spend arguing about which actor was in which movie. 
And yeah, right, you did it too, if you, if you lived back then. The minute IMDB came out, no more arguments, right? Because there's now evidence. I don't have to say, oh no, I'm pretty sure that was Mr. McConaughey. Because I can just go and say, oh look, IMDB knows, right? It's the same thing in your organization. We sit around and we argue about these assumptions that we have that we don't have any proof for. And in the end, not only do most of these assumptions turn out to be invalid, um, even the ones that are valid, they're rarely even as much as 60 or 70% what we actually expected them to be. And so your culture as an organization, especially if you're responsible for developer operations or de um, you know, relations, your goal should be, let's stop spending our time with these assumptions and let's figure out how we can validate those with evidence. And you know, just for the record, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. It's actually completely reasonable that you as a software professional would have assumptions about things. Those beliefs are based on your deep experience as a professional. And it's not having the belief or the assumption that's problematic. It's choosing to operate and move forward based on that, that assumption without identifying it and then figuring out how to, how to validate it one way or the other. Because the big problem is we are wrong a lot, okay? And it's not that we're bad at doing this. It's that the nature of complex work means that we can't assume our way through the, the woods. So let's talk a little more about assumptions and how they fall into different buckets. Because like I said, once you start looking at this, you'll realize how common these are. So the first one I want to talk about is our customer assumptions. And this is uh, like around customer value. Do we believe our customers will value what we're building? Or the desirability. Do they have a desire to use this? And usability falls into, into these, this bucket. Now, I start with this bucket because this is the one that matters the most. All the rest of the assumptions can be pretty big, but if your customers don't care about the thing that you're building, nothing else matters. So those, those are the big categories of that and some ways that you can think about this. And when I'm trying to think, how do I identify an assumption in my organization or on my team, I like to use the phrase, I believe or we believe, because it helps you start to identify, you'll notice, all right, People don't think about these as being assumptions. Our customers will pay for this, right? You, you've heard that. Oh yeah, I know our customers will pay for this. I know our customers will want this. Um, our users would choose to use this. Do we know? We just, we speak in these kind of confident things. Our users can figure out how to use this. There was a great meme I wanted to uh, find that was said, hold your thumb to the screen or something, and the person's holding their own thumb way off from the screen. Users are very unpredictable, but we have confidence in our assumptions about them. Um, oh, this will solve our customers' problems. Sometimes you see organizations that figure out the right problem to solve, and then they do not figure out how to solve the problem because they come up with an idea and they're like, ah, this will solve our problem. So if you start to think about these and use a we believe, then you can see that these confidence statements don't actually have that much uh, weight underneath them. We believe our customers will pay for this. We believe our users will choose to use this. But then you have to say, oh, that belief, how do I know it's true? Let's talk about some other kinds of assumptions. Come on, we can do it together. Ah, yes, business assumptions. These are assumptions about the viability of the idea um, or potentially the business model if you're, if you're starting from small, and, and about the business opportunity. Most of the overwork that hits development and engineers and, and all of us is around assumptions in the business, in the C-suite or at the business level about the business opportunity of any given situation, right? So if you can start to see and identify where these business assumptions are, and think like a business person, how can I help this business person identify these assumptions um, that then you can maybe solve some of those problems. We'll talk a little more about this. So what do those look like in more detail? 
Business assumptions, again, often spoken with confidence. We can make a profit with this. This idea is great. This is going to make us profit. Oh, this aligns to our vision and strategy. You don't actually hear most people talking about this because most organizations almost never talk about vision and strategy. But even in ones that, that do, it's not uncommon to hear confidence, oh, we figured this thing out. Um, oh, I missed the channels one. So many business assumptions. All right, so let's talk about technical assumptions. These sometimes are the businesses, the business people's assumptions about your technology and the technology that's, that's being developed. But these are also your assumptions at, as technologists and builders about the technology that you're using. Um, we call this feasibility. It, feasibility can extend beyond technical assumptions, but we'll talk about that in one second. So what do these kinds of statements look like? Our engineers can build this. This technology supports our needs. We can keep our customers' data secure. We can overcome our tech debt. All of these spoken confidently, but what, what's the underlying assumption? Oh, this is just a little. <laughs> It's funny. Oh, I, I moved too quick. <laughs> Did you guys get that? It's pretty awesome. Go back. Okay. <laughs> QA is wrought with assumptions, right? Assumptions about how our user is going to break our stuff or. Um, I, I was trying to get plugged in here. I had this new clicker. Could not get it to work. I had it plugged in. <laughs> I had it plugged into the, um, the, the HDMI instead of the USB. So, you know, I was going to be there all day. We have assumptions about our pe how people use these technologies. OK, so that was a good joke. Um, I literally don't have any idea what's next. Oh, OK, yeah. Our engineers can build this. We just did this one. Our technology supports our needs. So there's no evidence for any of these things. So what do we do about it? If we don't want to spend our time arguing with hippos or being bossed around to build things that aren't actually valuable, we have to introduce the idea of evidence. So we've all watched crime shows, and we know that there's different types of evidence. So you know you need good evidence. So let's talk about some evidence. There's different types of evidence based on the type of assumption that you're trying to um, validate. We're going to start by coming back to those customer assumptions, because again, those are the very most critical for us to test. So the thing about evidence is, on the left, you'll see we have light evidence. These are things typically you will see people um, saying. You can't believe people. They will tell you lies. They don't mean to tell you lies. They don't understand themselves either, right? Like when people tell you something, this is why if you're ever building a business, don't bring your idea to your friends or your mom at all. Because either way, the information they will tell you is totally invaluable. They'll either tell you it's great, and you'll say it's great, I don't need to check on that idea, or they'll tell you it's awful, and you'll let yourself dis be discouraged. Again, you're operating off somebody else's assumption versus saying, how can I test this idea and make sure it's good or not? Um, oh, no, I want to go back, because I think this is really important. On the left, the strong evidence, the do, the facts, the, re the real world, the high involvement. Let me give you some examples. The strongest evidence you can ever get that somebody wants this thing that you're creating is if they will give you money for it. Like mic drop. That, it, that is the single strongest evidence you can. It's, it's why Kickstarter is so genius. Because if somebody will give you enough money to build a product, then the product has validity. Anything that requires people to actually be highly involved, all right? There is a lot of early 
um, product testing people that will tell you gathering an email counts as evidence. Everybody in this room has seven or eight burner emails that they use when they need to get past an email wall. That is not, there's not real involvement in that. That's me knowing how to play the game. So if you want evidence, you need to figure out ways to make the people highly involved. Okay, so I want to show you, this is called an assumption map. This is a tool that we have found to be incredibly powerful for agile teams to use as a conversation tool adjacent to their sprints, okay? Using this as a way to drive a conversation as I'm walk walking into a sprint or into potentially a large initiative or a larger initiative to try and make sure we're talking about these things and figuring out how to validate them or not before we start into development. So let me show you how we're gonna use this. You get a team together and a bunch of sticky notes. I'm a big fan of big visible boards, so I would often do it in person, but there's templates on both Miro and Mural that you can go and they're free, that you can start assumption mapping just right out of the gate if you've got a remote team, if you have distributed teams. So you'll see that this pretty standard matrix, on the top we have importance, this vertical line, on the bottom is unimportance. And then over on the left, we have strong evidence. And then over on the right, we have weak evidence. All right, so we're going to sit down with our team, and we're going to think about each of the buckets of um, assumption types and talk through the assumptions that we as a team have. So we're going to start putting stickies up here. This one says, we believe we can attract our customers using XYZ. We believe that this is going to solve our customers' problems by X. We believe that our customers will buy this product because of Y, right? We're saying what the assumption is and why we believe it. So now we can put those based on both how important they are to our business, all right? How much would the business fail if this is not true? If we are wrong, what would be the impact of this? And these are all relative to each other. I only have four because I got tired of doing it, but um, you could have a lot of these, especially if your team has never talked through any of the assumptions that are underlying the, your project or your product. Um, you're putting them relative to each other, and really you're trying to well, you're trying to be realistic with yourself about where you are, you are right now. If, if someone says, oh, but we're in the process of, or we're going to buy, or we're doing, it's where you are right now that matters, and what evidence that do you have. So I started with green. In this example, my greens are my customer assumptions or my um, desirability assumptions. You should always start there. Because again, if your product doesn't bring value to somebody, if a customer doesn't want it, if your users are, going, are not gonna use it, the rest of this doesn't matter. But of course, I want to circle here the last one who's supposed to show up. Um, I want to, once I get all of my feasibility ones up there, then I'm gonna start on some of my uh, business assumptions. We believe we can keep our customer data secure. Oh, this is, this is a technical assumption. Sorry, my blues are my technical. We believe we can keep our customers' data secure. We believe that we can handle our legal concerns. We believe that we can solve for our technology challenges by X. Um, I worked on this project quite a few years ago. And it was a very complicated fund management platform. Um, and if you know anything about uh, VC funding, that world is super, super, super complex. The lead engineer chose to use a, um, a database, Neo4j, that was the right solution for the technical problem. But an assumption that we had as a team that we didn't realize until in retrospect was that our engineers who were only experienced with um, traditional databases were gonna be able to use Neo4j. It was fairly new at the time, and that we would be able to hire anybody for it. And so we still probably would have chosen that technology because it was the right technology for the technical challenge, but we also would have done a whole lot of things different if we had identified that assumption. So I really believe the technical assumptions 
can be just as insidious as any of the, um, the feasibility assumptions because those are often the things that torpedo a team, right? Coming back to my statement at the beginning where I said we're, under, we're overworked but we're underutilized, a lot of the times it's our own assumptions that maybe got us there when we assumed something was going to work a different way and we didn't surface those assumptions, especially with on the technical side and work through those early. So how do you use this quadrant now that you've got it? So over here on the very left, you've got strong evidence and it's super important. That's great. You've got evidence. You're going to move forward on those things. The bottom quadrant where we have strong evidence and it's unimportant, you should just not even pay attention to that stuff because it doesn't matter. Over on the, bo um, the bottom, uh, weak evidence and unimp unimportant, again, not worth tracking down evidence for unimportant things. You don't need them, so don't spend your time that way. And then, of course, this quadrant with the circle who came in early is the area that is most likely to cause me problems, whether they be my technical assumptions in this area, my business assumptions in this area, or my, um, my feasibility assumptions. Okay, I don't know why we got that one again. Okay, so how, now you've got your assumptions mapped and you're ready to do a test. So how do we test? Um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Our goal early on with a lot of tests, low code, no code, low effort, low cost. These are some examples of some various relatively simple types of tests to run. Landing page tests, smoke tests, where you essentially give people a smoke product, a vapor product, um, and prototypes. You know, seeing NASA again, they use those prototypes very, very effectively. Now, there are a ton of resources on testing. Um, things like Lean Startup have a, just great testing ideas. There's a book called Testing Business Ideas that also has great tests. These are readily available on the internet. So the thing that I want to tell you is around this. Over on the left, we've got uncertainty. And over on the right, we have fidelity. And in between, we have time. And this is why this is important. If you are all the way over to the left, go cheap and go fast, right? If you have a ton of uncertainty around a particular assumption, you want to test it as cheaply and as fast as humanly possible because you want to get it out of your queue of assumptions so you can move on to the next one. Um, and then as you get more fidelity, as you move from left to right, you increase the time that you spend testing that idea because in a lot of these ideas, we're not just going to test them once. Coming back to NASA and, and their experience with the lunar landing legs, it was critical that they be right. They needed the utmost confidence that their idea was going to work. And so they continually built better and better and better prototypes that were higher fidelity so that they could ensure that, that they had nailed the solution. And in fact, the very last tests that they were doing were in 1968, they were doing them in space to still make sure that these legs were, were, were the right thing. Now, not all of your decisions are lunar lander leg kind of serious. So if, if the decision and the assumption isn't likely to torpedo you, don't spend a lot of time on the prototype. Don't spend a lot of time on the test. Spend as very little time as you can on the test. Now, I think it's really interesting. You all are DevOps people. This is actually a pretty hard thing to do. And, and you know, right now, this is the domain primarily of product management maybe user experience, designers, et cetera. But there's no reason for it to be that way. Like, um, in my mind, developer operations should include any kind of tooling it takes to get a solution to our customer. And if we're figuring out kind of new ways of working as teams, and part of what we say is a new way of working is we're going to validate a lot of these assumptions without code, 
then it should be a rallying cry for people in DevOps to say, how can I bring my skills to help us solve this problem of so validating these assumptions, getting, turning these assumptions into evidence? So building innovative products is not about what, doing what feels safe. There is a perception that doing discovery and experimentation is a waste of time. And there's a perception that delivering code into market is the most valuable thing a team can do. Um, you know, and sometimes I think in our effort to give that predictability to the business, we've strengthened that perception. Um, and you know, in the modern business world, things move fast. And I truly believe speed to market is a competitive advantage, and it, it always will be. But, like I said, we really need to figure out how to remove those assumptions. And so we have to make learning and discovery a key part of how we do our jobs. I'm learning. Um, here's the best way I know how, and that's to implement it into our Agile processes. So how, how many people have heard of dual scrum or dual track scrum? Anyone? No one has. Okay. That's fine because I'm not even going to be a proponent of that. Um, <laughs> I was going to disagree, but now I don't get to. Um, your, your learning should be embedded in everything that you do. So here's how we've done that in, in the incubator that I work in. We have implemented learning as a ceremony as part of what we do. And we, we do it a couple of ways. The first is, every day after stand-up, and everybody's only doing 15 minute stand-ups, I'm sure. Um, every day after stand-up, we also have a quick learning conversation. What has happened on the learning front in the, in the last day? Here's a test I ran. Here's an interesting tidbit. The other thing we do is called a learning readout. And we do this pretty much like a sprint review. It comes either right before or right after the sprint review. It is for the business people, but also for the team. For the team to show this is what we have learned over the last sprint. And we have a cadence right now where we typically can validate or invalidate between two to three assumptions in a sprint. And some of these might just be a UX person and a product manager going and doing something very simple around doing some research. Some of these might be a low code something that one of the developers whipped up and threw out into the wild. Or um, it could even be a, something like a spike where you're going to do some research. The interesting thing, I think, is to see the power of starting to talk learning-based into your executive team. So everybody knows, like, the business doesn't believe in research. But part of the reason why is because we've never showcased really effectively how much money it saves them. So for example, if you come up with a way to test an assumption and you realize you didn't build a feature that would have cost your team three months and four people and all of the support stuff, what's the price tag of, of that validation that you did, right? You, uh, it's $150,000 you just saved the company in a feature that was never going to be successful. Not to mention, we all know, the more features you put in, the more technical debt you get, the more support you need, right? So what is the value of an idea that we don't take to market? It can be huge. And I had a team that had a metric that they would report on right along with metrics like velocity that said running total of what we've saved the company on not delivering features that nobody freaking wanted. Okay, so reward your learning outcomes. Um, my other kind of side note on dealing with the business. I work with this woman. She, um, she started at Sears as a cashier in like 1971 and ended up working her way up through Sears to become the president of Discover Card. 
And I was interviewing her for um, a, an event we put on at my work. And I said, I said, Kathy, Discover Card, when it came out in 1987, like this whole rewards thing, credit cards didn't do that, right? They were mocked, they were ridiculed for coming up with this idea. And it's funny because now you look at the credit card world and no credit card worth its salt would think of not having some sort of a reward cash back program. I said, Kathy, how did you continuously get these crazy innovative ideas pushed through like business stakeholders? She said, it's one thing, money. You always need to be able to show the trail to the business of the financial benefit, either how you're going to save them millions or how you're going to earn them millions. And the beauty of learning is that you can start to have conversations that are evidence-based about how you can earn more money and how you can save more money. OK, I'm running out of time. So Bill Nye says, if we think together and we work together, good things are going to happen. And I agree. I'm going to give you my last point. This one's probably my biggest fighting words. Um, this is kind of the flip side of the let the let the develop bring the developers forward, and this is the let the team figure it out. Um, if your team has shown a propensity to deliver reliably, and they say, "Hey, you know, we want to try Kanban," let them do it. If if a team continuous improvement is about like that's autonomy. And that is a team being able to say for themselves, we can uncover our own best way of working. And every time I ever bring this up, people will tell me, oh, but if we let, if we let them do that, they'll, they'll kick out their scrum master. They'll kick out their product owner. They'll set a standard for what you expect as far as an output on, on unit tests, on the amount of testing of ideas and assumptions. But let a team figure it out. If they want to abandon scrum, let them abandon Scrum. Make it about the results and the outcome and the impact that a team is having. And stop trying to tell people how to do every little thing. That's where I'm going to end, I think, today. Let's see. There's probably one more. Oh, yeah. High five. Like, they know how to do teamwork, right? They don't... Oh, wait. One more thing about teamwork. Um, well, no. I'm done. OK. This might say thank you. Oh, no. Trust instead of direction, right? Give your teams trust. It's the single most empowering thing you can do. Um, it really does supercharge a team. All right, this one I'm sure is it. Oh, I have time for questions. I have two minutes and 24 seconds. Anybody have any questions? I promised the, the microphone people I'd save it right till the end. Because if not, I will do an interpretive dance. And I'm not a great dancer. I actually am a pretty good dancer. All right, well, we're not going to do questions, although I'll bet there's at least one person who has one question. Come on, don't let me down. Oh, I knew I could count on this guy. Uh, you talked a lot about learning in the early phases of, of you know, trying to figure out stuff before you get it out. Um, do you have some suggestions for learning after stuff is out? What do you do? You've got it out there. You've got it delivered. Um, uh, you know, not only how do you learn, but then what do you do with that? Talk to your customers all the time. And, you know, never think of this assumption and learning as something that happens as a before. It's a during. Like, we literally do assumption mapping around every single, um, every single sprint. It's part of what we do. What do you do with the learning? You change direction. Right? You know, I mean, you've seen those pictures about the difference between um, iterating and incrementing. If you're stuck in incrementing, then what do you do becomes a really hard question because you've already got your roadmap set for you. If you're truly iterating, if you learn something that's ch going to change your trajectory, you change your trajectory, right? Like, it's, it is a powerful difference that we have a choice every sprint to do something different with the output and what we're building. Um, oh, one more thing about, uh, about learning and your cadence. If your teams are carrying work, right, sprint to sprint, you have to put a stop to that. 
If you are doing that, you have broken your learning and your feedback cycle, right? Because you, you, you don't have a delivery mechanism anymore. If your teams are not delivering and committing and like at the end of the sprint have something that's actual software, fix that. That's break it into a smaller increment, find something smaller to deliver so that you can iterate because you can never iterate if you can't get something out the door. Okay, did that answer your question? Thank you, sir. Yeah. Oh, right, the microphone. And I'm out of time, so. I'll go quickly, thank you. <laughs> um, so part of learning also, I think, is teaching. And my question in tech, we have a lot of people that are very brilliant and very smart, but occasionally some of us are not great teachers. What would you recommend to augment that as well. I think that's also something we have to learn, but any techniques when you're going through I, that? I think design thinking um, is a great technique for that. And I know that uh, sometimes design, design thinking gets a little bit of a bad rap, but the best way to teach people is by doing. And you know, the beauty of design thinking is when somebody's got a pile of stickies in their hand and they, they are saying things and, and contributing, they're also learning about processes that help them kind of advance and, and they're doing it in a way that they're contributing while they're simultaneously learning. I, I, and we're getting more aligned at the same time. So that, that would be a big one for that. Make your organization, if you can, pay for some outside learning. In fact, there's a great article by John Cutler that is kind of what I based this, let the teams figure it out. You should go read it. Uh, you can just Google let the teams figure it out, John Cutler, where the team decides to abandon, they're going to, they decide they're, they're going to transform themselves. They abandon, they don't need a scrum master, they abandon their product manager, and they figure it out themselves. It's a pretty cool way of looking at, um, like, learning how to be different and how a team can, can work together to learn to elevate themselves. Okay, then I'm done. Thanks, guys.